Edge Dwellers Cafe is a regularly irregular, long-form, interview-based podcast featuring conversations about politics, environment, and mental health in a world on edge. I'm your host, Ben Habib, international relations academic, environmental educator, and neurodiversity advocate who likes having a chat over a hot coffee. My caffeinated conversations try to make sense of the different kind of edges that define us, divide us, and shape how we interact with each other in a world that's under stress, and what it means to be a little different. Greetings, Edge Dwellers. This is your host, Ben Habib. Here for another trip to the edge, soy latte in hand. Now, if you're based in Australia, you might be familiar with the ABC TV comedy series Utopia, which follows a team of bureaucrats as they navigate the madness of bureaucracy and politics in a fictional federal government department called the Nation Building Authority. Utopia is hilarious, but it really should be reclassified as a documentary. As a former public servant and a current minion of university bureaucracy, Many of the organisational tomfooleries that they satirise on Utopia deeply resonate with my actual experiences of working in big organisations, and I know that I'm far from alone there. Utopia and other TV shows and movies of this genre like The Office, Workaholics and Office Space, they hit a nerve because they shine a light on some of the deeply dysfunctional aspects of large organisations, whether we work in them or interact with them as customers or clients, students or stakeholders. In this episode of the EDC, I'm joined in this spirit of utopia-inspired critical bewilderment by very soon-to-be Dr. Sarah Hausman to talk about her PhD research into non-hierarchical organisations. This is a great chat. We discuss the many functional problems that arise in hierarchical organisations. From power relationships to functional organisational stupidity and leadership cults, we also explore non-hierarchy and decentralisation as alternative organisational structures, along with the challenges faced by organisations transitioning from hierarchical to horizontal models. Sarah is a long-time friend and colleague in the environmental education space, and I've been fortunate to have supervised her PhD research. Sarah has over three decades of experience in the not-for-profit sector, private enterprise, and in the public service. But before Sarah and I dive into the deep pond of organisational madness, please indulge me for a quick plug. Don't forget to support the EDC by clicking the like or subscribe buttons, and or leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on. You can also help support the production of the podcast by making a one-off or ongoing monetary contribution of any amount via my Ko-Fi page, which is linked in the show notes. All contributions through Ko-Fi go towards offsetting the initial cost of covering research, hosting, editing, and equipment for the podcast. Now, with that nod to capitalism out of the way, I give you my conversation with Sarah Hausman. We're not as funny as Utopia, but just like Rob Sitch, we don't miss. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. Sarah Houseman, welcome to the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Thank you, Ben. It's a great honour to be here. Having heard a few of your interviewees, I feel very excited to share my research. And this is really fascinating research. You know, I've been working with you on this as supervising your PhD project for, what, five or six years now? And, yes, yeah. I think it is that. <laughs> I can't quite bear to acknowledge how long it's been, but it's, it's taken time to get us there, and thank you for believing in it from the beginning. Give us an intro about the research that you've been doing and the professional background that you're coming from that led you to want to investigate this stuff. I think that's really relevant because my interest in researching the poss- what becomes possible when people work in a non-hierarchical organisation really came from my experience over three decades in a range of different roles, whether they be not-for-profit community organisations or private enterprise, uh, where I worked in family business and corporations. 
also I've worked in the public service in multi-layered bureaucracies. So I have a pretty good understanding of, if you like, the limits and the strengths of organisations where hierarchy is the default structure for decision-making, authority, but also relationships between people. In my roles, I worked as an employee at levels such as general manager and executive officer, also as a middle-level participant within a bureaucracy, and, of course, as on many boards, whether they be not-for-profit or for-profit, as a volunteer, member of a board and chairperson. So what attracted me to organisations, having worked as a volunteer and a paid person, over time was the power of organisations, the power of people coming together, bringing their intelligence, their different ways of thinking about problems to change society, really. Um, whether it be for a commercial concern or a public concern like education or environmental change. However, part of the reasons that I was drawn to do the research was I saw a weakness in the default structure of the leader and follower, which is a very important part of any hierarchy. So in that, I found that when I was the leader, so many of my staff would default to my thinking as part of just that automatic respect of the leader. And that often wasn't the best outcome for the organisation at that moment in time. So that was one of my interests in seeing, was there another way of doing decision making? So Sarah, we met at a Education for Sustainability workshop on campus here at La Trobe Uni back in 2014. And it's just by chance we ended up in a breakout room together, if I recall correctly. And got talking and realised we had a, a great convergence of interests. But I'm really interested to hear more about your journey as an environmental educator. Because uh, obviously to, to end up in that workshop, there's a much longer backstory that led you there. So education for sustainability. It's funny, I've from doing this PhD... Or maybe environmental educator. Yeah, but no, even environmental education, I feel like... You know, one of the problems with the way sustainability is engaged with, it's seen that if we do the education piece, then we'll sort the problem. And what I'm really saying here is that unless thinking about sustainability is integrated in the top line of organisational values, that it's always going to be that ad hoc extra that as soon as budget runs out or the new phase of leadership, which is what happened, changes, then suddenly education for sustainability doesn't have to be involved. So I, I feel a bit cynical about initiatives after being part of environmental education. Victoria's had a fabulous program that went to as many schools as wanted to be part of it. And there's probably a decade of investment in that. And I'm not sure what difference it made. I mean, maybe it has, and I'm sure there are many children who now understand the principles of sustainability, who understand systems and see the effects of their energy-saving behaviours, but maybe then they'll just go shopping, have a drink, chuck it in the bin. You know, it's sort of a good idea but not enough. Which is a a great framing for our discussion today because awareness – does not lead directly to action, and that's the whole point of your research, isn't it? That's right, because a non-hierarchical organisation, every participant has skin in the game of governance. Every participant is doing governance. And one of the, I suppose, big ideas about traditional hierarchical governance is that some people are better at it than others, Ben. There's a whole lot of people who are not sensible enough knowledgeable enough, good enough on a range of implicit and explicit values to do the sensible, important work of governance, making decisions about resources, making decisions about people, place and investment. What this research has shown is that ordinary people actually can make 
very sensible, good decisions. Maybe more so when the context becomes more neutral. And by neutral, I'm saying neutral from personal advantage. Even in my work in the environment movement, I saw that sort of we can't help but lose our sense of, I suppose, integrity for values when we're all struggling against each other in a sector to get that grant to keep our organisation running. So the competitive factor undermines changing the world for good. So from that perspective, what drew you to this research? My interest is to explore what structures support radical or even more deep-seated change in society and in organisations. And I come to this as a feminist, but also as a strategic systems thinker. Having studied fabulous methodologies such as strategic foresight and also looking at strategic leadership through sustainability, fabulous work. However, so hard. It, It felt like even though I had the tools, nothing was significantly changing. And I think we see that with equity initiatives in many organisations where we might be ticking the box about inclusion and diversity, but we don't live it and the experience for women and people who are less advantaged than others is not that they are included in the higher echelons of decision making. Um, So that's what drew me into thinking, is there another way? What becomes possible when we take hierarchy out of organisations? And one of the challenges actually in doing this research was finding organisations that were confident, non-hierarchically structured entities. And that in itself is an interesting thing. My research, I found four organisations and by chance they were in countries that were wealthy settler societies of Australia, New Zealand and the United States. I was open to other countries. However, in my scanning for possible organisations, none really emerged in, for instance, Asia, the Middle East or Europe, and I'm limited by being an English speaker only. So as you're going through this research and you're looking at the lineage of thinking or the lineage of thought and the the key figures In this field of non-hierarchy, so this is a a field of thought that's been bubbling away and developing for a long time. So the problems of hierarchy are long recognised. They're not new. Who are some of the the influential, influential figures or even the heroes in this story that have been developing a response to the problems of hierarchy over time? It's interesting that you use the word hero. It's definitely heroines rather than heroes in this story. It took me a long time, actually, to find the threads of people exploring non-hierarchy. And there are different terms used to describe a horizontal organisation rather than a vertically structured organisation. I'll use the word non-hierarchy because I feel it really describes very clearly the social relations. That's going slightly off your question, Ben, about who were the people who've helped, I suppose, look at some case studies because a lot of the work is grounded in the practice of organisations. The strongest thread that I've uh, found came from the US in the late 70s as a result of the women's movement and the peace movement the social justice movements. One particular author is a woman called Joyce Rothschild, and she did her PhD in the late 70s and explored the possibility of non-hierarchical organisations, which she called collectivist democratic organisational governance. And at that point in time, it's so pertinent to remember this, it wasn't conceived of as a possibility at all to have adequate professional governance that was not structured as a hierarchy. So a lot of the early work of feminist often, but not all, 
looking at non-hierarchy was to even show that it worked. And much of the case studies looked at collectivist feminist organisations or peace organisations, and some of them were a little messy. And I think what people often remember within the literature is the failures of non-hierarchy. Jo Freeman, in her very influential paper, The Tyranny of Structurelessness, has really equated, in the minds of many current scholars, non-hierarchy with governance that lacks structure and then leans into power plays, destructive ways of making decisions and power cliques. So unfortunately, that approach has meant that people will just discount the effectiveness of a non-hierarchical model. And I think a lot of the followers of Joyce Rothschild's work have really sought to show that it can be an effective model of decision-making. It's really obvious, isn't it? The impulse of people who initially think, fuck hierarchy, I've I've so had enough of these larger structures that I'm part of because they're so destructive and you know they're damaging for the soul in a lot of situations. And you've got people who are effectively traumatised by their experiences working with and interacting with hierarchies. And so the the initial impulse is to say no structure. But it doesn't work, does it? It certainly doesn't work. And in fact, one of the surprises for me in this research was that the non-hierarchical organisations are very structured. It's not a lack of order. It's not a lack of structure. It's a different style of relationship. And in many ways, there is an openness that might not be able to exist in a hierarchical context but that doesn't mean that it's unstructured. So your research drew on embedded field research with four different case study organisations from Australia and elsewhere. Can you introduce who these organisations were and and briefly what they're about? Absolutely. The first organisation was Friends of the Earth Melbourne, with whom I'd had quite a long relationship. So I was familiar with their activist orientation. And they have been a non-hierarchical, or as they would say, anti-hierarchical organisation for over 40 years. The second organisation was the Inspiral Foundation. It's hard to know if Inspiral is an organisation. It's a community and it has spawned many organisations within it. So it's, it's like a hub, a generative hub for non-hierarchical explorations of organisation. I know that sounds incredibly vague, but its openness is part of what has made Inspiral such an interesting network. And I was referred to Inspiral by a colleague in the UK. So that shows how far the story of the Inspiral Foundation has travelled. So this is the, the org that's responsible for the Medium website, isn't it? It's not responsible for Medium, but it publishes in Medium a whole thread of conversations about doing work differently called the Inspiral Tales. And um, now there is an Inspiral Europe as well. So they're really working or allowing the idea and the way of working together to spread as far as there are people to pick up the interest. Then the third organisation was called the Sustainable Economies Law Centre in Oakland, California, which I call SELC for for briefness. SELC is, to me, was quite an inspiration because SELC is a law firm. And in my context in Australia, law firms are often very hierarchical and law firms are concerned with profit and very, it's, it's unusual to think of law firms when all the lawyers choose to have an equal pay policy as SELC do. SELC have a very transformative social, political and economic agenda. And so non-hierarchy was the logical structure. And I think that choice really illustrates that there's a synergy between a desired social outcome or economic or environmental outcome 
and the choice to be non-hierarchical that emerged through my research. So these three case studies, as I said at the beginning, they agreed to be named while the individuals who contributed to my interviews and participators have not been named. But they are what I call confident non-hierarchical organisation. The fourth organisation didn't really meet that criteria, but I included them in my research because I'd had a long-term relationship with them and they were interested to participate. And thirdly, I was interested to see how does an organisation that is structured initially as a hierarchy, how does it transition to become a non-hierarchy? And this organisation is the Pachamama Alliance, which is based in San Francisco. While I had maybe not the same engagement with the Pachamama Alliance, the engagement I did have illustrated how courageous they were actually in choosing to step away from hierarchy again for, again to be acting in support of their vision for social environmental change. They were prepared to really turn all their relationships and their organisational structures inside out by becoming non-hierarchical. You talked about supports for non-hierarchy. And aside from scholars who are researching non-hierarchical organisations, there are a number of more recent examples of scholarship where for-profit organisations who choose to become, or let's say, play with the idea of non-hierarchy or decentralised relationships where those organisations look to intellectual supports and tools. Two of these. One is Frederick Leloux's 2014 book, Reinventing Organisations. That was, it really created the possibility of seeing that this could be done and showing organisational leaders that there were great benefits of non-hierarchy, particularly in relation to innovation, because you're freeing up participants to be able to be more relaxed in sharing ideas, which actually allows for greater creativity. And then a second important text is Brian Robertson's book, Holacracy, published in 2015, gives very concrete tools for organisations wanting to organise in a decentralised way. And Brian Robertson's work came from the programming industry where they had to really respond to a more agile, flexible, collective way of working than a normal hierarchy would allow. So one of the foundations to enabling these confident hierarchies of this decade is, I think, also the whole digital way of working. Yeah, well, we've seen the COVID pandemic and particularly the lockdowns and work from home phenomenon has, has opened a window, hasn't it, for, for a, a larger experiment with decentralised work and decentralised production platforms that wasn't there when this work was being done prior to COVID. That's right. I think it's certainly forced, it's forced many organisations to trust, actually, trust that workers will do what they say they're going to do without being monitored by being in the office all at the same time. So that sort of asynchronous work practice is, has been enabled by digital systems and non-hierarchy thrives with that sort of model. It's interesting looking at when you're looking at the Pachamama Alliance as your case and that they're in this process of transition from a hierarchical model versus the other case studies where they've kind of set themselves up that way. And it's a very, very different pathway, isn't it, to establishing the structure from scratch as non-hierarchy and having a horizontal structure versus having to transition. And I think this illustrates a, a real issue when we're talking about this topic is It's okay to start from scratch on the fringe, but most of the society is starting from hierarchy and that transition problem, that's where the real action is going to be. So what what observations have you got on this this tension between starting from zero versus having to transition? I hate to say it, but I think the discomfort that comes from the transition may put people off. However, 
the rewards of the different sort of relationships that become possible within a non-hierarchy may get people through the transition stage. But I think it is harder than could be imagined to become a non-hierarchical organisation because every relationship changes and processes as well. But I think it's the relationships between people where leaders have to learn that their voice doesn't have the same authority that it used to have. And as someone myself who's been in a leadership, in leadership roles, we can take for granted the power we've been given, you know, the authority that's given when you, and as a teacher, Ben, you would probably have that same thing. You're given a lot of credibility and it, that is, that is a form of power and it can be used as a power over or we used as a power with. And I think that's, that's the power over power with the concepts became clearer when I looked at the change with Pachamama. So you're talking about power over power with, I have come to these concepts through Starhawk. Oh yes. Yeah. And, and her yep. activist writings. One of the great permaculture elders, but also outside of permaculture, one of the great social activists of the last. Yeah. Uh, the last 50 years or so. Uh, and in her writings, she talks a lot about the difference between power over and power with, and also power from within as well, what mm. you bring to yourself. What are you seeing in terms of, or what are your reflections on how power plays into non-hierarchy, how it plays into the transitions from hierarchy to non-hierarchy, and just in general, how do power relationships manifest I mean, now I'm rambling. <laughs> I'm going to good. cut that question short, but you know where I'm yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that's good. There are three important concepts that underpin a non-hierarchical organisation, and they are equality, diversity, and inclusion. And look, there are other things with underneath that that we can look at, but I came back to those three as like anchors to think about what was going on in these organisations. And equality, diversity and inclusion, they're goals. So each of the confident non-hierarchical organisations, that is like their benchmark of engagement. What was interesting is when we have an equal relationship, then if you like the unequal, the desire to create a hierarchy, the desire for superiority or control or limiting another person, that becomes way more evident. So it's like it's in that environment without hierarchy, in the absence of it, we see the hierarchy we carry, that we create the hierarchies, each individual, even me and you, Ben, with our best intentions, with our work for social change, we unwittingly will create a situation of domination or limiting of another. So that's power. The participants in Friends of the Earth, in Spiral and Silk, were very clear that power was something they had to grapple with. Now, in most organisations, we don't talk about power. It's, it's, it might be part of a critical analysis of what's going on from a feminist point of view, from a queer perspective, turning everything upside down. But it's not something speaking truth to power in a hierarchical context can get us at and is very uncomfortable and often full of conflict and personal attack. And we see that all the time in the current political situation. We've seen it with Grace Tame not smiling. So in this context, a non-hierarchical organisational community and the individuals within it have to learn how to engage with the urges to control others. So they have become self-aware. So self-awareness emerged as one of the important attributes of a non-hierarchical worker, and that's a becoming thing. Non-hierarchy itself is a process, and I think this is where, again, we're in a whole different language of organisation. Most governance is seen as a fixed, structural, we do this, we get that. Whereas in a non-hierarchy, we understand that relationship, the quality of our relationships, respectful, inclusive relationships create collective trust, 
and then we can have open decision making and really look at key issues. We can look at difference. We can include diverse perspectives. You can say to me, I don't agree with you, Sarah, and I'm not going to throw, reject, belittle you. I'm not going to humiliate you in order to continue to have my sense of being right or better, etc. Just that commitment to those three things, equality, diversity and inclusion, is a profound transformation of any organisation. And I think it's very hard, and, and we see this in all the initiatives for inclusion that actually don't succeed in, in having greater inclusion of women, of people of colour, of people with different educational background or people with different abilities. You know, we're, we're not seeing the power shift. I want to model this. Let's model this with yeah, you and I. Yeah, sure. I, I think this is important. Like when you say power relationships and people are thinking something outside, but you've raised the really good point that inevitably in any interaction between people, there are a whole bunch of different power hierarchies at play. Whether you like it or not, they're there and they have to be named and acknowledged and dealt with. So between your eye, what are they? We have, of course, the hierarchy that we can slip into of male, female. You're a white male. Mm -hmm. I'm a white female. I'm a white middle-class female, but then we've got another hierarchy, which is I'm a white Anglo female and you come from another culture. Lots of different cultures. <laughs> yeah, lots of different cultures. But it, but in Australia, some of the cultures had a different class context from the class context I came from. But we also have the hierarchy of teacher. You are part of my, how would you call it? Well, teacher, student. What makes the hierarchy so sticky is that there are intersections intersections in relation to gender, class and race are the simple ones, but there are many, many more that we could unpack between us. And those intersections are obscured by normal hierarchical relations and in a non-hierarchy they emerge. In the in the case study organisations, even when they had practised working on, on these intersectional hierarchies, I noticed that they were, they're still delicate to deal with. Like for you and I, we've been working closely. We worked in this project for six years, but then we were in other relationships where I was, you were a board member and I was the chair of the board. Yeah, that's a good point because for the kind of the first half of our relationship, like you've been my mentor uh, at Oasis on the board when you were the chair and I was uh, a board member. You're obviously older than me, so there's the the age power hierarchy there. And so when you came to study here, it was it was an inversion of the power dynamics to a degree that had been how our relationship had formed initially. So that's been interesting to navigate that, and that that hasn't always been comfortable for me. Just yeah, understand <laughs> slipping into that new role. Absolutely, and likewise for me too. Um, I think it was. Yeah, I feel like you're very generous in allowing the spaciousness for us to work that out um, because many a PhD candidate and their supervisor, it is a delicate dynamic. So I think we've been able to navigate that maybe because we have some practice in what is a very important tool of a non-hierarchy, which is non-defensive communication or non-violent communication, it's more commonly known as. We have to change what we do, how we structure ourselves, but also how we speak to each other, how we receive each other. And, you know, going back to the Grace Tame with Scott Morrison and Jenny Morrison on the Australia Day event and her face that she was making, which was showing that she wasn't happy. Another way of looking that at that without judgment that she was impolite could have been curiosity and care for her. She was obviously uncomfortable and not happy 
in that moment. So a non-hierarchical approach would be not to take that personally, not to disenfranchise her further, but to say, look at her, be with her. What is it that makes you feel so alienated from us in this point? How can I be different? And I think curiosity, spaciousness, not jumping to defensiveness really is the culture that enables non-hierarchical relationships to sort of come forth. Like they have to emerge. It's not a snap, turn on the light situation because we are learning how to speak differently and for many of the people of my interviewees in these organisations, for many of them, particularly the women, it was hard, hard to feel like they had the authority that their words were valuable, that they could offer something to governance. And that really confronted me, Ben, because many of these people were, for instance, in Selk, they were lawyers obviously smart people, very competent, yet they didn't, because of the intersectional hierarchies and power dynamics, they didn't think themselves as equal of being a contributor to governance. And I think their personal growth, as in their becoming aware that I have something to contribute, not that I'm better than you, but that all of our voices together actually create an outcome that is the best for all. So that's one of the big paradigm shifts of a non-hierarchical organisation. It's not my idea versus your idea. It's how do our ideas come together? How do we agree to move forward? And a key word is consent. Whether they be a consensus decision-making organisation, that's one methodology, consensus, or a consent-based, consent-based organisation, all of non-hierarchy is based on a consenting relationship. That means no coercion. Bullying undermines and destroys a non-hierarchical organisation. So, again, coming back to this, the difficulties of the transition process that you're describing here is that everyone within this transition process has to unlearn very deeply ingrained cultural roles and has to process traumas that have developed from existing in that old hierarchical system through this process. So when you're talking about non-hierarchy as a practice and about relationship, that, that unlearning process is so difficult, isn't it? Yeah, it is difficult. And, you know, I don't want to make it appear like these people (laughs) just sit around with their brows wrinkled, having difficult interpersonal conversations because they don't. You know, they do all their work and they do this processing or becoming aware of how they might have thought about something, you know, making that change. Yeah, it's not just a matter of do this transition to non-hierarchy or just do nothing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, when we're, when we're existing or working or clients of hierarchies in various ways, it's not like we're doing nothing. We're processing the impact of that structure on our moment to moment existence. It's not consequence free. So even though there's a lot of work embedded in the transition to non-hierarchy, there's still a whole bunch of work involved in treading water to maintain yourself and stay sane or attempt to within a hierarchy. I think that was one of the one of the motivation another one of the motivators for me in doing this research was finding that up to 75% of workers self-identified as being disengaged from their work in a hierarchy. And disengage might sound like oh I'm not present here. But the psychological term used to describe what happens within the psyche of a person who says they're disengaged is that they have decoupled part of themselves from another part of themselves in order to stay sane at work. 
So there's a massive cost which has been documented by psychologists and other social theorists to say that working in hierarchies leads to patterns of chronic stress, to disease, to death. And I was thinking about that, thinking about coming and talking to you, and I thought, well, you know, that might sound extreme, but then if we feel like we have to work beyond our limits, if we're feeling like we can't be ourselves, if we have to protect ourselves from coercion, from violence, from um, harassing intervention, minor, a look, a touch, just many, many small things to outright humiliation. You know, that isn't good for our soul. So, you know, the dilemma I think of this research is that non-hierarchy is possible and it takes work and it's different work than we're used to doing. In a hierarchy, we're used to coming out of that meeting and probably having a pretty good bitch with our colleagues. In a non-hierarchy, that actually is incredibly rare. People don't need to bitch Ben because it's transparent. There is no one making a decision. There is no one who is coercing us to do anything and we have to put up with it. We have the freedom to say, I don't think that's a good idea because. And in fact, the structure of decision-making in a non-hierarchy means you probably never have to quite say it like I just did. It's explored, ideas and approaches are explored in an iterative way. That means we go around in cycles. We don't ever say, have an adversarial model of, I present my idea, no, that's wrong, yes, that's right. It's more like, let's unpack that. Let's look for clarifications. Let's look for weaknesses and strengths of those ideas as a group. So proposals are much less personal, whether they succeed or are put on the back burner. The other thing, in a hierarchy, we might make decisions quickly because they can be pushed through by an authority figure or series of authority figures who work together to achieve a particular outcome. And yet we all know in the doing of those decisions, they can be sabotaged, they can be made ineffectual, and they can be resisted, therefore. So power, power we're never powerless, actually. So we have, whether we're in a, in a hierarchy, we can resist the effect of the leader and their decision-making. In a non-hierarchy, while the decision-making may take longer, the outcomes are much more efficient and effective because there is total agreement in a functioning, thriving non-hierarchy. There is total agreement about, yes, we're behind this. Actually, I should probably qualify that idea of total agreement because I think one of the misunderstandings of non-hierarchy based on the misunderstanding around consensus decision-making and Joe Freeman's work from the early 70s was that there's this laborious and very painful process where everyone has to absolutely agree on every word. Actually, in a consent-based organisation, everyone doesn't have to entirely agree, but everyone has the opportunity to speak their perspective and to explore the idea. The most extreme point of disagreement is called blocking. And and in all the organisations, they made it clear that when someone, an individual blocks a decision, actually that's an indicator of a breakdown of relationship. So most decisions are explored on the basis that going ahead with it will not harm the organisation. And there are sort of layers of decision-making. There's many different methods that people use in a non-hierarchical context to indicate their agreement. And they might not care about the decision, for example, 
or they might say, look, you care about it more than me. I can see that it doesn't harm the organisation, so go ahead. So there's not necessarily requiring all of us to agree, but what it does require is everyone to consent to go ahead. And I think that's a subtle difference um, in a non-hierarchy from a hierarchy. Of course, when it comes to the rapid machine gun decision-making of managerial elites in a hierarchy, when they're made quickly and, and pushed down the chain as something that needs to be acted on urgently, really that's a projection of power that's not necessarily related to the actual urgency of the task. And often those decisions are demonstrably flawed. (laughs) Absolutely. And I think that's why a number of for-profit organisations are deeply interested in non-hierarchy because, yeah, it's flawed and it's expensive to make flawed decisions. Yeah, there's all that collateral damage, isn't there, that has to be dealt with after the fact that takes more time than if you Mm. just took the time to think it through. And I think... That sort of what Matt Salverson and Andre Spicer have talked about a stupidity-based theory of organisations, which to me always reminds me of the Emperor's New Clothes story that I told my children because only the innocent or the mad have the audacity to speak truth to power. And so even some of the most intelligent people will allow a stupid or a stupid decision to be perpetuated through an organization because basically there's fear of difference, fear of conflict and fear of change um, and fear of challenging power. Mm. That's the power projection element of this urgency and, and rapidity of decision making, isn't it? Just keeping organizations in a state of permanent revolution to minimize the dissent that comes with that decision making model. Yeah, and I think that's a motivation for me in looking at non-hierarchy in 2022, this is becoming more and more uh, alarming, is the state of the planet. And I've framed this research within the Anthropocene and the Anthropocene is the new geological era of the planet Earth. And after 10 million years in the Holocene, which was the most stable environmental period on Earth, we are now in the most disruptive period that, as someone who's lived between both epochs, this one does not have a good projection for for humanity. And yet we have the data. We've had the IPCC show us the projections. We know that we are creating an unlivable Earth for your children, for my children, for the trees out there beyond us and all the critters that survive in that ecology around us here at La Trobe University. So we know this and yet we're being a stupid society. You know, this is the age of stupid where we will continue doing what will destroy our world. So the Anthropocene, my research isn't about the Anthropocene, but I want to contribute to decision-making in the Anthropocene. I want to contribute to a different future for and with the Earth. And my framing has been a post-humanist framing because I think the Anthropocene indicates that the conceit of the Enlightenment, that the human, well, (laughs) I, I love the white male human, is the most rational, objective, intelligent, superior species on Earth. That that conceit has been shown up to be false, misguided, and frankly, pathologically dangerous. We have so many inquiries, we have so many intelligent rethinkings, textbooks, reviews of governance, calls by political scientists for rethinking. And yet, as Catherine Chen has illuminated, an, a non-hierarchical scholar, we actually don't have a picture of what, how we can do what governance differently. So we actually, we need to have 
we need to flesh out what would it be to have relationships that were equal and not dominating? What would it look like? What would it feel like to make decisions with the earth in mind? And that that would be for all organisations, from the tiny to the corporate. I think that is one of the possibilities, not that you have the earth as an agenda item, but if we are thinking in an interconnected way and if we have many voices contributing to our decision-making, then someone will ask that question or someone will think about issues related to sustainability of sources, of outcomes, etc. Yeah, the Anthropocene and the, the damage that humans have done to the broader ecosystem has reached a stage now where it's it's destabilizing hierarchy. Hierarchy is eating itself because of the damage it's done, and that's changing the goalposts of everything about the human social world. And so I'm I'm zooming out because this is what I do. I try and look for patterns, and I'm zooming out and looking at the crazy politics around the world at the moment. And what I'm seeing, if we look at the whole bunch of social justice movements that are, are coming to the fore, this is a call to try and reach for that world of relationship and equality. And then we're also seeing this counter revolution against that, uh, in the form of the, you know the authoritarian creep and the rise of the the far right globally. Is a, it feels like a, a really desperate grab to maintain the old hierarchies, even as they're being destabilized. Do you have any kind of meta view on, on the moment, given the Anthropocene framing of your research? It's a, such a big question. And I want to say, I hope, you know, I want to say we're going to live happily ever after. <laughs> you know, I want, I see there's hope in non hierarchy and there's, that it gives people, it feeds people so that people feel better about themselves and others. And that is a contagious. Feeling good is contagious. And the default is hierarchy. Many people, while I've been doing this research, many acquaintances and friends who are who have taken action in their professional lives for a sustainable future have said to me, yeah, but non-hierarchy is not possible. You know, there's such a deep-seated belief of the superiority of the leader and its embeddedness as a cultural archetype where we have godlike, saviour, heroic, masculine images. You know, as a woman who's been a leader, I've come up against that a lot because I am decisive and assertive but that then is bossy for example you know those silly stereotypes and plenty of people have written about those and illuminated their effect but such profound archetypes are indications in our media we see that all the time we're looking for a better leader than x because we want someone who is stronger, more powerful, more articulative, more articulate and assertive. Where I see hope, if you're talking about the mega trend, is, for instance, in Australia and our forthcoming uh, federal election, is in the growth of independence. Because the independents have the opportunity to be flexible. They're not bound by ideology. There is an overall value base of, in many cases, with the climate, Homes of Courts Climate 200 group of independents is that they've got, you know, strong principles. They're acting for a healthy future in terms of environment and social issues as well. Edge Dwellers Cafe. Ben, you talked about, you know, a meta, yeah, the meta trend. Or was it, a, is it a trend? Yeah, a meta trend. And I think that two ideas that have been floating around for, I don't know, at least 50 years become really pertinent to understanding how non-hierarchy might emerge more 
strongly into organisations and why people might choose it more and more. And one of those is ecological thinking or systems thinking, and the other is reflexivity. We talked about the stupid organisation and scholars who are approaching organisational change have identified reflexivity as a way of thinking together that allows a group to be or is an indicator of a more responsive group. A reflexive organisation is actually, it's willing to become something different than it already is. So it's willing to change on a profound level. That change can occur through dialogue, through open dialogue, through a critical reflection, through being able to examine feedback from the system, whatever your system is. And I think this is what we've seen as, well, it is a barrier, hasn't it been, to say feedback around changes in the environment or we've seen it in Australia with the hashtag Me Too and Enough is Enough. The whole gender issues that are emerging in politics at the moment is that the leaders of our federal government appear unable or unwilling to take that feedback and then be responsive, even when they've had clear directives from uh, reviews and such. That's a good point because hierarchical organisations are by design not reflexive and the power relationships and the structural layering of power through these organisations is explicitly designed to keep them how they are. That's right. So flex, and that's been the strength. You know, it's been really good. And if we were going to war together today, I'd be happy to know who is going to be making the decision. So of course, the hierarchies will continue to be needed. They're needed in a hospital. They're needed in many organizations, but they are not necessary in all. I wanted to come back to my point about the meta observation. So I, I don't want to simplify it as two teams going against each other because that's not what I mean. I'm thinking it more about that there's two or a a basket of different trends that are pushing one way and a whole bunch of other resistances to those trends that are kind of counterbalancing that. And that plays out not just globally but within the individual, like that tension of the transition process that we were talking about before. Within the individuals, like you, you're acculturated to hierarchy, but you're trying to be something else. Like that meta trend is reflected within. I, I wonder whether this is, well, cultural and generational. Because looking at the context which has enabled these different non hierarchical organizations from the 60s and 70s in the 2010s, and this now this decade, what has changed is the digital world, but also the if you like the forebears, who are the boomers of the early collective organisations, collectivist organisations, looking at can we organise ourselves differently? We've learned from those what hasn't worked there. When I looked at the case study organisations the average age of the participants was late 20s, early 30s to mid 30s. Now, I didn't ask everyone their age, some, so I can't be exact. And I know there were very few participants who were in their 50s and even in their 40s. So there was an openness in that generation and a yearning in those generation of participants to work differently That's not a direct answer to your question, but I think that's an important element here that might say we are part of a generational change, a group who are not like our political leaders who are in their 50s generally or above, mainly men. So here we have a group of young people who are willing to experiment with decision-making, also experiment with expectations around living situations, around income, around what is an economy, around do we have children, how do we have children, polyamory. You know, these questions 
are not outside a thinking once you throw out hierarchy. There's the openness of a reflexive thinker allows a lot more to open up. And then the feedback of feeling being in a workplace where for many this would be just unbelievable, where you feel respected, welcomed, valued, cared for. Consistently, that was the feedback I got from the participants in Selk, Friends of the Earth, Melbourne and in Spiral. Not that they didn't get annoyed with each other, not that they weren't irritated, not that people weren't frustrated at times. I mean, it's not a honeymoon to work in a not-for-profit, non-hierarchical organisation, but there were some deep satisfactions that were distinct from my experience in a hierarchy. The non-hierarchies enabled the participants to have a critical engagement with relations of power. If you think about the reality of doing, you know, the work, going to workplace, everyone has their job in order to keep an organisation going. So you might ask me, how do they, how does a non-hierarchy include engaging with relations of power? How does this even become possible? Each of the organisations really valued having a deeper retreat, time out, that was facilitated and structured and also unstructured and collective in its orientation where they could get to know each other better. So there was that building of interpersonal trust. To be reflexive also requires learning to listen to other people, listening with openness and curiosity, and as I've said, being prepared to change. So when we look at critically engaging with relations of power, that willingness to let go of one's privilege. I think that sort of deep inquiry, personal inquiry and collective inquiry is probably fairly would have to be seen as a moment by moment possibility, even in a non-hierarchy, because we might have a really great meeting and we might have, you know, months of everything working really well. It doesn't mean it's going to work well forever. So the shift from thinking in a, I don't even know, what would you call that word? It's its that fixed way of process. Well, do we not even think about? Linear process. Well, I'm thinking about if you think of non-hierarchy as practice and we think of relationships as dynamic and alive, then we have to continue to relate to our relationships like they are alive. So we have to continue to nurture what is between us and what is between each of us in the group. So we we care for the health of the collective relationships and that's more important than winning. So one of the byproducts of non-hierarchy is that competition just, it didn't seem to be a thing. There's nowhere to go. If everyone's paid the same amount, there's no ladder to climb. There's no winning. The winning, if there is that sense, is the collective winning of moving further towards one's mission. So, yeah, that's what I was trying to I just want to see. Talk about that as a becoming process. It's a dynamic process, non-hierarchy, and I think... All organisations are in fact dynamic, but we don't consider it is. We don't, in a hierarchy, we don't put the same attention into the relationship. For So, for example, HR might look at an annual performance review. A lot can go wrong between annual performance reviews and disengagement is not picked up in that sort of, well, in a very formal ticker box approach. And I think the atmosphere, therefore, that can be created in a situation where there's inclusion and respect and a sense that I can be more of myself. No, that's interesting because a relationship is much different to a reporting line. Yes. And key performance indicators are not relationship dynamics. No. I think that's a great point. The relationship is different to a reporting line. Because a reporting line is flat. 
And I'd like to just talk about some of my methods that I've used in this research because two things I did that were non-traditional. I asked participants questions and they referred to policy and practice and things like key performance indicators and what was working and what wasn't working. I also asked people to do a drawing of their organisation and not a drawing as in an org chart, but a drawing of the dynamics of decision-making and power, how that was working. And what was fascinating in that, Ben, was that many of the drawings showed an ecology, a three-dimensional dynamic relationship between individual parts. One example was a rainforest and this particular person had drawn the bird poop and the fallen log and they were noting the importance of the fallen log for the insects and the fungi and they had a little few little bits of fungi to nurture the soil to allow the big trees and that branches would fall from time to time. So Within that model, their organisation, this was an spiral drawing, their organisation was like the rainforest. I might be a butterfly in that organisation. You might be a tall tree with deep roots that benefits from the fungi and loves the, the nutrient coming from all the, fall, the fallen trees. That's a very, very different picture of an organisation than a two-dimensional org chart or a PR sheet. And even the fact that these organisa- these the drawings showed the relationship between the parts, that all the parts together made the whole and made it work. They also showed that their little ecology, their organisation was part of a bigger ecology and that they weren't going to be able to be sustained without engagement in the bigger world. And that came in the form of ideas of people that in order to keep growing, they needed to have input. So it's a much more open sense of organisation in relation to the world as well. Now, your method for getting your uh, research participants to produce these drawings is really fascinating. And it's something that I've drawn on in in class activities with something my with my students, although in a much more simplified way than you have. But you drew on using a tarot deck as an emotional prompt to get people to arrive at these three dimensional drawings that you've you've talked about. I actually went the other way. So I used the drawings to give an indication of, of what their feeling was about their governance. I think that's one of the, the, well, let's say it another way. One of my frustrations after years of being in board meetings is I would often feel frustrated or feel irritated or feel angry or feel joy and not have anywhere to express it. I know that being in an organisation, we live it, we feel it, we're human beings so I wanted to bring out the feeling and to bring out the, to have a sense of, yeah, where were people, what were they feeling about their engagement in these organizations? So the drawings helped. And then I used another method, which was tarot cards, because I wanted to integrate people's experiential responsiveness stimulated by an image. Before we got to the mind, before we get to what we should be saying or any sort of conditioning that the mind does. So I drew upon a number of researchers that looked at a more holistic engagement with knowledge making and that involves feelings. It's not part of the way decisions are made within our superior enlightenment humanist world. It's very outside that, but it is aligned with other ways of knowing that value image, story, um, the power of our intuition. So I drew upon a thread of ethnography that was interested in looking at different tools for engagement tools that engage our senses, and that meant potentially, you know, embodiment, but also 
smell, touch, etc. And the images I used came from a tarot deck. And the reason I used a tarot deck was that I wanted to, it's something I've followed for many years, and it's definitely an edge dweller, um, <laughs> edge dweller sector for sure. I used the mother piece tarot deck that I discovered in the 80s, showing my age, and loved as a young woman because these cards, they're circular and they are envisaging a world that is non-hierarchical, that respects the sovereignty of all beings and nature creatures, you know, ecology, as well as a vision of peace on earth. It feels like the drawings in the tarot deck provide an entry point for accessing feelings that are really difficult to verbalize straight up, especially when you're, you're dealing with a researcher that you don't necessarily know and there's, there's not layers of trust there. And dealing with some of those traumas from working in hierarchy that, that everyone's processing through this transition. So what did you find through using these in that respect? I think it's really interesting that you identify the texture, I suppose, that was contributed by those different methods because I drew on some work by an ethnographer, Annette Warren, who made the comment that in institutional governance, power is deodorized. And I love that expression, sort of getting rid of the senses, getting rid of color, getting rid of movement and embodiment. So by using drawing and by using the tarot cards, I really brought flavor, if you like, and texture into, or the participants did. They were able to share their intuition, their feeling, their emotions through their selection of cards or their drawings. So I've used the Intaro as an interpretive device. That really separates it from what might traditionally be associated with the tarot, which is as a divinational tool. Instead, I'm seeing that the tarot, because of the richness of the images and because it really explores a human life cycle, it really gave people, it was a tool that helped people to indicate feelings, responsiveness, from an individual and collective perspective. I think the richness of the artwork on the particular deck that you used too was was important to that. Yes. The Mother Peace deck, which was created by Vicky Noble and Karen Vogel in 1981, was feminist, non-hierarchical, inclusive vision of the world. The tarot is quite a symbolic, yeah, it's a symbolic tool. So it's embedded with images that are not limited by language. The thing I I use the tarot just in the final five minutes of a one-hour interview, and I often found that that final conversation opened up my understanding and even participants' understanding of themselves in relation to their non-hierarchy profoundly in a way that words just couldn't have done. And what emerged also was some strong themes and consistency. So in a 78-pack deck, there were a number of cards that were picked across all organisations. And so they gave, they gave me an indicator of some of the qualities that were unique in hierarchy, but also some of the, the weaknesses or the challenges to the non-hierarchical participant and um, the organisations themselves. And I use the tarot deck to explore the idea of emerging archetypal images. I haven't used the idea of archetype maybe in a way that people may be more familiar with, which is as a stereotype of I am the king, like the archetype of the king. I've used it, or the archetype of the mother, as a sort of a fixed essence. I haven't used it in that way. I've used it following James Hillman's approach to see the archetype as an indicator of a yearning or a necessity within, so that when 
there are a number of cards that were picked that showed that people found a sanctuary. They found safety in their workplace. All the images that were picked that were repeated showed collaboration. They showed people working together. There weren't many images that showed an individual. They also used the cards to show that many participants felt nourished. They felt nourished from a, like a soul, spiritual perspective, but they also felt nourished intellectually by being part of those organizations. One thing that definitely emerged through the cards was the vulnerability of the human enterprise within the Anthropocene, the vulnerability of a small not-for-profit organization in a world that is hierarchical where the default is towards power and domination for the experience of these organizations that are working for social change, social justice. One archetype that emerged was to do with the form that the non-hierarchical organizations met within, and this was the form of the circle. So the circle emerged as a physical but also a symbolic representation or reflection of non-hierarchical relationships. So we've got a circle where we all sit around it. We can all see each other. So there's a transparency, there's a visibility. Compare that to the triangle, where, which is the traditional shape associated with a hierarchy. And in a triangle, those at the very bottom may never, ever see those at the top, at the pinnacle. So in a non-hierarchy, there's visibility, which can, of course, be excruciating at times. And there is that sense of being seen, being witnessed, being exposed, that emerged, that at times participants found that uncomfortable, particularly if they were grappling with some of those, their own inequality, if they're grappling with their issues related to gender, for example, which emerged within some of the organisation's conversation. And it was very interesting that the circle emerged as such an important archetype because that echoes back, really, it's an ancient meeting architecture, isn't it? How many people have sat around the fire, sat around the circle where there is respect for all when we're working in circle because we've seen and known. The circle also works as a process. So in Selk, they had a very clear, disciplined approach to working around the circle. And when I suggested just an ad hoc, like a popcorn response to questions, they said, no, we would prefer to go back to our discipline of working around in the circle. And I realized on reflection that, of course, that is, it's such a strong practice because it meant that every voice is expected to speak. They have the opportunity to pass, of course, mm -hmm. but when I expect you to speak and you're expected to speak, that means the space is created for each person to participate and it doesn't allow for the most dominant or the people who are the most extrovert who have the ideas that pop into the head and want to share again and again. It means that those who need more time have got time because they know the circle will come around to them. So it's a very, very powerful practice to work in circle. And there are many social change groups, Indigenous groups, also the whole restorative movement works in circle because of this visibility and equality. And the circle was highly valued by participants as one of the important ingredients to a healthy non-hierarchical practice. One of the interesting observations from your case study organisations was about the role of the founder in some of these organisations and and how just the existence of the founder creates a hierarchy in and of itself, uh, whether intended or not. 
Now, that piques an interest for me, obviously, as someone who's been involved in the permaculture movement and seeing, you know, what Terry Lay, who's from the University of Newcastle, who's just written the book on the politics of permaculture, who's talked about permaculture as being a bit cultish because of the, the role of the, fa- the two founders in that movement and, and looking at how permaculture's kind of blown itself apart you know, over the last 12 months because of some of the actions of, among other reasons, but because of the actions of David Holmgren and his participation in some of the anti-vax protests. So tell us about the, the centrality of the founder and not necessarily about permaculture, but how this role shapes the interactions that happen across an edge organisation. Yeah, the founder was so interesting I think because in a non-hierarchical organisation, the founder emerged in a funny way, not as the only hierarchy because once you start to really reflect on hierarchy, there are many, as we discussed earlier. But the founder is an archetype that is recognised because often the founder is someone who has particular qualities. You know, they're often charismatic. They can articulate a vision. So they have a personal power that attracts others to them, and that is a hierarchical dynamic. In Selk, the founders still worked in Selk. Pachamama, the founders worked in Pachamama. And in Inspiral, an individual who'd been part of the founding impetus and the conceptualisation of Inspiral, he had consciously stepped back because he was aware of the effect of his being, the strength of his being, and how that reduced the autonomy of our of, of others. How others would, if you like, give away their personal power to his personal power. The fact that these organizations could reflect on the shadow, the unconscious projection of power onto the founder and someone giving up their power to the founder. They they could reflect on this dynamic, Ben, which I found extraordinary. There was a high level of awareness of the influence of this person. In the case of Selk, we had a collective, reflective conversation, myself with the participants, and we explored with the founder, who is part of the group, her influence and she shared some of her struggles. Again, extraordinary, I think, that we're able to talk about that with the foundation of equality, inclusion and diversity. We They actually had the tools to talk about it. Not that it would magically disappear, but it was on the conscious articulated agenda that there was a difference between the founder and others. I also think that, you know, where you give the example of permaculture movement, in a sense, because the work hasn't been done, um, and this is a big statement, I don't know, I'm not part of the permaculture movement, and you can you're challenge familiar, me on you're this. You're very familiar with the permaculture movement. Oh, yeah, movement. yeah. I, I mean, lots of people in it. Absolutely. Mm. But I wonder, has the work been done there to deconstruct the power relations? Has the work been done for the persons or the people who are seen as knowing more than other people. So is there some within that movement who know more and are better than others? Because that is that moment where the hierarchy is created and then can we say, is it allowed, is it possible to say, I disagree? If you can't disagree without being excommunicated, then there's a real problem in that movement because it's just created another, as you use the word, cult, and maybe it's cult. I highly value the the concepts of permaculture, but if we can't reflexively unpack them and look at the effects on the system of some of the ideas, then I think we've started to replicate a hierarchy, and some destructive patterns. Yeah, it seems to me that's a work in progress right now. That's right. That's right. Because it takes 
a lot of courage. And I saw that with the participants of the, sorry, the founders of these organizations. They have to have the courage to let go of some of those privileges of being that founder. And it is a particular role. It's a particular passion and particular attributes those people have. And so it is, it does take courage to let go of them and to let others stand up. And I think that's, again, comes back to one of the powers of non-hierarchy in the Anthropocene is that it allows, it's a method and a structure that allows flexibility, responsiveness and change to systems feedback. So it's a very dynamic way of working together. Are some of the dilemmas of of the founder replicated in a generational change as well? where you've got maybe a core of original participants who struggle with being able to pass on the baton or or that there's friction points when you've got a a generational shift in one of these organisations? I think that's a really, really pertinent point. And as we speak, Inspiral is going through quite a big change. Who knows what that will become? In a funny way, you know, if it's been operating for 12 years and it's spawned a whole lot of organizations and people who then have gone forth and transformed work. Does an entity have to continue? Maybe it doesn't. I mean, part of our rigid approach with hierarchy is that we have to stay the same and be the same. So letting organizations evolve, do their thing, and then dissolve may be also another indication of health. But I think definitely the founding group within a sp- in Spiral have moved on to other things and that has changed that organisation. So it is now responding to that change. Friends of the Earth will always evolve because it's a movement-based organisation and they, as an organisation, you know, with decades of experience, they know how to renew and allow renewal. Selk have also have structures that allow the organisation to expand their their different organisational units, can expand and contract with people, and they are still um, in a major growth trajectory. I saw that people will change and will leave these organisations, just like anything. You come, people at Selk said people grow here, and they did grow, but that doesn't mean they want to stay there forever. But when I asked them what would you take, many of them said they would take the circle decision-making. They'd take that iterative cycle that helped bring all voices into the process. Mm, That's an interesting point. Maybe I'll share a little bit about my Mm. where I'm at with the permaculture movement at the moment and because it feels very much like that. I I came to permaculture in 2014 when I did the PDC at, at Ceres and that was an auspicious moment for me to discover it because I was at the beginning of sort of the mental health awakening that I've been on ever since. It was in the context of an organizational restructure uh, at my workplace, which was the second in two years and was deeply traumatic. And like on reflection, I was looking for a route of escape to something radically different and permaculture kind of fit the bill. Now at the point now, I feel like, like I've learned so much in permaculture and, and you know, love the, the design system itself. But I've also come to a point of thinking, well, people come to it because it's this escape and that escapism is not necessarily what I need now. And it's not necessarily right for the moment more broadly that I'm thinking more about integrating what I've learned into the broader experience. So yeah, I, I deeply resonate with that, that idea of the journey. And that you get into a place and and learn what you need to. And then it's not always right to stay there. And I think you've mentioned the word trauma a few times and I hadn't picked them up, picked it up. And I want to acknowledge that the concept, the idea that people come into a non-hierarchy with wounds from being bullied and from having to decouple parts of ourselves, from being ignored or disappointed, whatever it is, feeling like you're just not good enough. There is, there is the nurturing, the safety of inclusion, of having our voice valued was seen by many as healing, as strengthening and as building their confidence. And so 
maybe this is what school should be, Ben. You know, and there are many alternative schools where this vision of how do we hold people, how do we strengthen them, how do we make life both having an edge where we grow and change, but within an environment that is safe and where we are consenting to participate. So definitely healing from the wounds of hierarchy is part of the role, I think, that a non-hierarchy plays. The world won't all be non-hierarchies, but if there were more non-hierarchies, if there was more of that quality of care and inclusion, I think we would have a more effective use of resources and people who are more excited by their work. You know, because I saw in these organisations people who are able to put forward something to follow their passion with their work, to be able to say, I want to do a project about X. And they were then supported because they put their case forward, they were able to take responsibility for it and then enact it. And that's a very powerful organisational model and it's a very powerful personal model. And they have a high level of accountability in terms of feedback. But I think that's one of the question of accountability is one of the challenges that you allude to with permaculture. And it's also an account, a question of many organizations that are relational because being able to say that's not good enough. Who says that? Where is that said in a non hierarchy? And it takes discipline and structures for these organizations to learn how to give feedback in a way that is critical without diminishing, but still people want feedback. It's actually a desire. So that was one of the gaps that emerged was the need for feedback. Um, that was more, tell me how I can do better. Tell me where where my edge is. So I think that was a skill. That is a skill. You know, we've talked about the victimization aspect of being sort of the victim of hierarchy, but most people in hierarchies have also, because of the nature of their roles in the structure, have also been the bully and have also gotten things wrong. I think we all, I certainly have. What did you see in your case studies of people being able to acknowledge not just their victimisation but when they've got it wrong and the path out from that? It's interesting. More people explored how hard it was to step up into their voice, to learn to share their voice and value their voice than turning their voice down or changing how they were. One participant talked about how in a non-hierarchy, when people don't step up, she felt her little miss fix it emerge. So she would fix, but also in fixing, she would control another person. And she was frustrated when that happened. And I think this is the other edge of accountability is how do you get people to do things? Well, you can't get people to do things in a hierarchy. There is no command and control structure. So what do we do when performance isn't up to standard? I think a lot of people are critical of non-hierarchies because of that, of where does someone fail in a non-hierarchy other than not turning up? So how we communicate without controlling that the grade hasn't been met, I think is something that is evolving as these organisations become stronger and more people come into them. I don't know if that's quite answering your question. It was slightly different. but Not quite, not quite. Because no one really brought it up, which is fascinating. Well, it's hard because you have to front up to get it wrong and... That's really difficult. No one wants to do that. And it's like, I get it, but I guess if you're talking about justice. Yeah, well, there was definitely the conversation around the invisible work that women do in organisations was alive and in spiral and silk. And what I saw there was an unpacking and becoming conscious of the taken-for-granted work of emotional labour. And that might just be welcoming people as they come in the door. Who's the person who's doing that work and who's the person who's speaking to the audience, which is a different work? 
who's the person who makes sure that all of the stuff for morning teas out been purchased and that the kitchen's clean and the bathrooms are clean, etc., etc. Like they're all, if you like, housekeeping. And in a non-hierarchical organisation where you don't have a cleaner, everyone's sharing responsibilities, for example, you don't have to do that, but these organisations did do that, then are these falling into a gender-based role or are those who are taking the responsibility for speaking and having the privileged role, are they going to say, no, I'll go and do the housekeeping today and you stand up and do the speaking? So there was an exploration around you do that speaking really efficiently or you do the housekeeping efficiently, but let's swap and let's start to experience that. And I think that's part of walking away from privilege. It's really hard to unpack those sort of the the emotional labour that, for instance, women do. Some of the research around non-hierarchical organisations shows that if the roles related to emotional labour are perpetuated, then a non-hierarchy will actually become more hierarchical again. So the intersectional dynamics need to have attention paid to them. And so the ongoing practice is a way to... Ongoing, deal with critical engagement with, with, yeah. with power. And simple things, rotation of roles, rotation of responsibilities, nothing staying fixed. And if you have titles, like you might have to have a title like a CEO because we're dealing with the world and people want to speak to a CEO. But let's make sure Ben's CEO this year, I'm CEO next year or the year after, so that no one gets fixed. Foucault talks about power in a way that I really appreciate the idea of when things become rigid, when they become fixed, when we can't allow them to move, that's when that calcification indicates that the rigidity is moving into an unhealthy spectrum. So things will always, there will always be a tussle. There always is going to be tension, I think, in humans in when we work together. It's just we're not going to go beyond that. But if the dynamics keep moving, then it's going to be a healthier world. And if I can, I can say my truth to you without you dissolving or throwing something at me energetically or physically, then you know, again, we're a healthier organisation. Sarah Houseman, thanks so much for joining us at the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Ben Abib, thank you very much for having me and for engaging me in unravelling some of my thinking around non-hierarchy. Much appreciated. I know, this is six years in the making, this podcast. (laughs) It has been, hasn't it? Yes, you've refused to have the conversation until now. Uh, So now... The opportunity is, and I think Australia is really ready for a bit more reflexive ecological thinking, don't you? Yeah, the moment is now. Yeah. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. Working in a big org is a constant lesson in irony. Universities and other big organisations like to offer their workers mental health assistance on building their personal resilience. Now, I hate to break it to the university managers and HR peons that actually buy this crap, but if you need to constantly make your workforce more resilient, it's a sign that your organisation is actually deeply toxic. No one needs to be more resilient in a healthy work environment. Sarah's explicit warning is that that toxicity, that office space-like functional stupidity, is an emergent outcome of the vertically stratified hierarchical structure of organisations. There has to be a better way, and the possibilities for something better is what Sarah is pointing us in the direction of. A reminder that you can support the Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and or send through a dollar or two on Ko-Fi to help me cover the costs of releasing the Edge Dwellers Cafe out into the world. And if you like what you hear, please do share the link around with other people in your orbit. Any of that support is very much appreciated. So that's a wrap from the EDC. I'm Ben Habib, and you've been listening to the Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast. 
Make sure you're on a first name basis with your barista. Stay safe and much love.